The history of drilling for oil offshore is full of booms, busts, boondoggles, and bankruptcies. As far back as anyone can remember, the sea provoked the passions of risk takers, those who wanted to make a difference. Offshore oil has never been for the faint of heart. Offshore oil has always had this sense of adventure, and it, it, there's a real keen edge that puts on it. From giant multinational corporations to independent wildcatters, the oceans became the ultimate frontier. We've had a history of having people that don't mind thinking broadly and outside the box, so to speak. There were no rules, no regulations. Just go out and do the best you can and hope it works. Fueled by the world's growing demand and dependence on cheap oil, the pioneers pushed farther and farther offshore into remote and hostile environments. Some people compare what we're doing in deep water today to what people are doing in outer space. The oceans and their vast reserves still embody the greatest challenge and reward for those brave or cavalier enough to explore them. One of the striking things is the, is the extent to which this is a fraternity. Uh, it's people who have literally grown up and gone out deeper and deeper together. The history of offshore oil is brief, yet bountiful. Lots of crazy notions turn into brilliant ideas that materialize in mythic proportions. The pioneering spirit of drilling for oil offshore began 24 hours after World War II ended. The rationing of gasoline was lifted, and America celebrated the wonders of oil. America was ready to roll after World War II. People had been waiting 10, 15, 20 years of depression. They'd been fighting wars for four and five years away from home. They wanted to come back and get on with their real lives. And the oil industry had grown steadily from the 1880s forward, but it was really primed to boom after World War II with the, with the growth in highways, the, the urge to get out and travel. After the war, demand for oil far exceeded supply. Drivers took to the roads at such a rate that gasoline sales nearly doubled by 1950. By now, oil had exceeded coal in meeting America's energy needs. It's the wildcat idea to go find oil. It's very obvious that bigger fields can be found offshore than on the land onshore that's been explored so thoroughly. So that's a, a big attraction. Where do you find some bigger fields? For millions of years, everything from dinosaurs to dead plants have accumulated on the seafloor. Through time, heat and pressure turned this organic material into petroleum, which has been trapped in reservoirs by layers of rock. The Gulf of Mexico was an ideal place to start drilling offshore because it had a relatively shallow and gently sloping seabed. Many of the most popular areas for oil and gas exploration today are what we call historic deltas, just like the Mississippi, where you've got a lot of junk coming out and being deposited. The Mississippi River basically collects all, all of the silt and sand and other type of things from the mid parts of the United States and comes out and dumps it. And it's been going on for millions of years. So the sands that we need to be able to ultimately trap oil and gas are there and have been laid down over the millions of years. And it's just a rich, very rich environment for hydrocarbons. At the birth of the Gulf of Mexico offshore industry, it's clear that, that the, the primary constraint on development of these offshore fields will be how much it costs to drill exploratory wells. The first concept was to actually build some sort of board road out over the marsh or swamp, build a foundation of piling and put the rig on it. And that was a lot of construction. And so then the idea came, let's dig a canal and put your rig on a barge and float the barge out there. In fact, barges of all kinds were left over from the war and in great supply when engineers hired by Kerr McGee converted a surplus Navy landing craft into a low-tech hybrid drilling rig. In October 1947, ten and a half miles off the Louisiana coast, they struck oil. For about five years, uh, the companies have more success with uh, this system where they have the old converted World War II ships uh, that, that are half mobile and half permanent. They build a small platform with a tender, they call it, and the tender holds most of the equipment and most of the men, and if you don't find oil, you can at least tow the tender vessel somewhere else. The trouble is, if you, if you have to build a fixed structure every time you want to drill a well, it becomes very expensive. And the deeper the water, 
25 feet would be five times as expensive as building something in 10 feet of water. In this period, those are just giant economic costs, and if you can't find a way to salvage some of the costs, uh, you just can't compete with the onshore drillers. And it's fairly clear in the early 50s that either that question will be resolved or the offshore business will not grow. In 1954, a young marine superintendent named Doc Laborde designed and built his own offshore drilling rig. His vessel, which was named Mr. Charlie, drilled its first well in 40 feet of water. It was one of the earliest mobile offshore drilling units. Designed to explore for oil in shallow water, several compartments in the barge were flooded, causing it to sink and rest on the sea floor. While the workstation on columns remained above water, if oil was discovered, a platform could then be built to produce the oil. If oil was not discovered, Mr. Charlie pumped the water out, packed up, and moved on to the next prospect. Between 1954 and 1958, more than 30 submersibles were built, each one different from the others. Mr. Charlie continued drilling until it was retired in 1990 and turned into a museum. By permanently mounting a drilling rig on a submersible barge, oilmen were able to move from well to well in a matter of days. This innovation not only separated the functions of oil exploration from oil production, but it lowered the cost of exploration which helped make offshore oil a viable commodity. Uh, at the bottom is money. Uh, control of the land meant money and um, uh, they didn't have much understanding at all in the 19, early 50s how much money, but it was clear there was money to be made by leasing the land. In 1953, Congress passed the Submerged Land Act which divided continental waters in two. The area within a three-mile limit was given to the states and the rest given to the federal government. This piece of legislation generated enormous revenues for the government, second only to income taxes. Offshore oil exploded. By 1957, there were over 100 new mobile drilling units. If offshore oil was going to continue to remain competitive with onshore oil, they would have to find ways to be more efficient and cost-effective. The solution was the lighter and less expensive Jackup rig. The Jackup is basically a floating barge with legs that are attached to the barge. So when you get to your drilling location, you jack the legs down to the ocean floor and then raise the barge up out of the water. And that way you have a stable drilling platform in which to conduct your drilling operations. The innovative Jackup rig attracted the attention of a young oil man from Midland, Texas. We worked out a deal with Letourneau, who had a new kind of offshore drilling rig, three-legged rig. None of the major companies or drilling contractors would touch it, so we kind of gambled and uh, built the first and second and third. With little or no solid information about wind and wave strength in the Gulf, the prospectors and their rigs were vulnerable to disaster. Our timing was good. We suffered a couple of setbacks. The third one or fourth one disappeared in a hurricane. I mean, it just vanished. We'd taken the people off and it was gone. Six million dollar investment. Currently, operators and contractors use jackups to drill most offshore wells. Apart from the legs and the jacks, the platform resembles that of a standard drilling barge. Through the years, different jackup designs have increased their water depth from 80 feet to almost 400 feet. It's an amazingly creative era for that mobile drilling technology and the reason it's so important so a lot of people have an incentive to, to work hard on mobility so that you can find the oil and move on and then have a permanent platform built wherever you find it. We had some ups and downs but it, I liked it. I loved the business. It was pioneering. It's been said that a drilling rig is nothing more than a portable hole factory be it large or small, offshore or on, its main job is drilling wells. In 1883, spiritualist H.L. Williams didn't even need to drill a hole to find oil after a modest earthquake sent a spurt of the stuff as large as a man's arm right out of the ground near his home several miles southeast of Santa Barbara. Eventually, Williams and others started drilling plenty of holes, and by 1895, there were 28 oil wells producing 16,904 barrels a year. When better producing sites were found on the beach, Williams built a rickety wooden wharf and drilled the first wells over the sea. 
By the turn of the century, piers and wharfs reached out 1,200 feet from the shoreline into water 30 feet deep. By 1910, all of these fields were in sharp decline, and drilling for oil off piers into the Pacific Ocean soon ran into a geological and technical wall. The continental shelf off the coast of California was steep and deep, and loaded with fault lines. The drilling techniques used in the Gulf of Mexico were impractical. If they wanted any more oil out of this narrow channel, they would have to leave land and drill deeper than they'd ever drilled before. The solution would come 50 years later, in an unusual scientific experiment. It was a, it was a glorious age for science in the late 50s and early 60s. We're, we're looking at space adventures, and they, they thought of the Moho Project as the exploration of inner space, they called it. If we were going toward the moon, as we thought we were, why not go toward the center of the Earth? Mohol is the name given to the area between the Earth's crust and the Earth's mantle. While the Earth's crust is approximately 24 miles thick, it is thinnest deep under the oceans. Scientists and oil men alike were interested in drilling this deep to retrieve sediment samples that could tell them how the Earth formed as well as how and where oil is trapped. This required, however, particularly um, um, large leaps forward in the technology of drilling offshore. The project presented an enormous challenge. How to drill to a depth of 25,000 feet at a site covered by more than 15,000 feet of water when at the time 200 feet of water was considered a test of technology. The mohole drill must go at least a mile deeper than the deepest hole ever drilled on land. In 1960, a group of oil companies converted a surplus yard fighter barge and called it the Kaswan. The vessel was designed with an oil derrick over a hole or moon pool in the middle of the ship. At this point, engineers faced two major problems if they were going to drill in deep water. First, the drilling column would have to be over two miles long. And second, how to hold the ship steady in waters too deep for anchors. When you go to floating drilling, the industry had to come up with ways to handle the motion of the vessel in relationship to the ocean floor which is fixed. And so over the years we have innovated and designed a lot of different equipment that compensates for this motion because a ship moves up and down in the water depending upon the waves and the wind that's happening. Having seen a New England lobster fisherman use his engine to remain stationary in water while pulling his traps, engineers decided that several propellers would be installed on the ship to counteract the wind, waves, and ocean currents. In March of 1961, 40 miles off the coast of Baja, California, in 12-foot seas, the Cus-1 drilled a 110-foot hole in 11,700 feet of water. The core samples, dating back 15 to 20 million years, revealed an ocean with far more life than today. Which was good news for the oil men, because where there are fossils, there is fuel. As quickly as it started, the Mohol project ended in bureaucratic bickering. While the project did not drill to the center of the earth, it did put Santa Barbara at the center of offshore oil drilling which was remarkable considering the 100-foot depth that was manageable from offshore rigs in the Gulf at the time. Not counting the oil produced off the piers at the turn of the century, California produced its first offshore oil in 1962. The market for marine drilling took off. After several years of drilling successfully, ships were developed with larger hulls and bigger drilling platforms. Positioning was aided by the use of a taut wire system attached to the sea floor. Any change in the angle signaled a series of thrusts from the propellers to push the vessel back into position. With drill ships, man could now begin to explore for oil almost anywhere on the planet. And still the technology improved. And at the heart of much of the, of the 1960s forward technology and offshore and indeed in the industry as a whole is the growing use of sophisticated computers. At the edge of offshore technology during the last 40 years is seismic data, which was directly affected by the computer revolution in the 60s. You've got to have a picture. You've got to have some a priori idea of what you're, what you're, what you're drilling for. And I think that the reason that, that we've come so far um, in, in, a, in a relatively recent amount of time is that those pictures are getting better and better. 
What people are looking for is areas where oil or gas are likely to be trapped. In the very early days, they'd toss a stick of dynamite over the side of a boat towing sound sensors behind it. The sensors measured the time it took for the sound of the explosion to travel to the bottom of the water and back up to the boat. These sound waves were recorded and made into a picture or structural map of the subsurface. In the beginning, all oil men had a crude picture with bumps on it. A lot of the early uh, oil was found on, on what I like to call bumpology. So many of the early discoveries we saw all around the world were, were, were drilling bumps on the surface, if you will. The bumps on earliest seismic pictures indicated rock formations on the ocean floor that could possibly trap oil and gas. But a lot of those bumps were a bust. An estimated 1 in 15 produced oil, which is an expensive drilling ratio. For years in the Gulf of Mexico, we worked down to a certain economic basement, if you will. That's as far as we could see. Anything beneath that in the subsurface we didn't pay any attention to because we had no idea what was there. But as sound imaging and computer capabilities improved, so did the quality of the information in the bumps. One of the real keys was looking at um, recording these echoes in three dimensions, we call it 3D seismic, where you put sensors in an aerial distribution and you can start to record all these echoes coming in from various reflections and through enormous computer power you can reconstruct these images so that they're an accurate representation of the three-dimensional structure of the Earth. The very latest seismic technique is the ability to capture subsurface pictures of oil as it moves through a reservoir. That's the fourth dimension, it's the time dimension. The greatest thing about, about this today is that historically we've been very inefficient in producing our reservoirs. Maybe, maybe 30 to 35 percent of the oil in place when we discover it can we get out of the ground. Partly because we can't see it, partly because it's not produced properly, we, we pump too hard here and not hard enough here. 4D hopefully will allow us to push that efficiency up to maybe 50, 60, 70 percent. So we don't have to find new reserves. We have to produce the ones we've already found better. Nearly three-fourths of the Earth's surface is covered by oceans. And nothing embodies the challenge of oil drilling more than these superstructures. Sitting defiantly offshore, these floating industrial cathedrals have revolutionized the search for oil and gas beneath the ocean floor. Today's drilling and production platforms in the Gulf of Mexico are a far cry from the permanent or fixed platforms of the past. The first structure was in 20 feet of water. And uh, we thought that was deep. The earliest platforms were made out of wood pilings and required considerable bracing, which offered limited resistance to wave action. With the availability of steel after World War II, the construction of modern platforms began in 1947 with the installation of the first steel structure in 50 feet of water. It was 19, I think, 54 before a platform was put in as deep water as 100 feet of water. And these were fixed structures that actually uh, consist of a framework called a jacket. A jacket is a tall vertical section made of tubular steel which is the foundation of a platform. Piles driven through the base of the foundation secure it to the sea floor. Additional sections on top of the jacket provide space for the drilling rig, equipment and crew. By 1959 platforms were installed in 200 feet of water. In the very early days, there was no way to have any kind of temporary structure. You had to go out and build a complete platform, put a rig on it, and drill. And then you might find oil and you might not. Historically, the size and development of fixed production platforms was determined by the size of the support equipment that built them. As the lifting capacity of the support equipment grew, so did the size and weight of the oil production structures. When we began in the very shallow water, the structures were probably wider than they are tall. But as we moved out into deeper water, the structures, to keep the cost within reason, you had to make, make them thinner, and so they became more tall and more limber. Fixed platforms of all sizes are constructed the same way today as the pioneers first built them. The jacket for Bullwinkle, the tallest offshore fixed platform in the world, was constructed in one piece in Texas in 1988. The 77,000 ton jacket was loaded onto a barge and towed 332 nautical miles to the production site in the Gulf of Mexico. Bullwinkle was positioned on site 
and under the watchful eye of nervous engineers, the structure was launched slowly off the barge, gradually sinking under its own weight. Ninety seconds later, the skyscraper-sized structure was afloat over the place where it would be attached to the ocean floor. Engineers opened flood valves that allowed water into the lower chairs of the tubular legs, bringing the massive structure into an upright position. Today, Bullwinkle stands nearly 300 feet higher than the Sears Tower in Chicago. Drilling in depths of 18,000 feet beneath the ocean floor, this superstructure is capable of tapping oil reserves almost two miles away through an innovative technique called directional drilling. With a 60-well capacity, Bullwinkle produces 200,000 barrels of oil and 306 million cubic feet of gas a day. That's the exciting aspect of the thing. We're doing stuff that people never thought was, ha was possible. 1947, more than 6,000 fixed platforms have been installed offshore in 55 countries around the world. By 1989, the year after Bullwinkle was installed, removal of fixed platforms outpaced installations in the Gulf of Mexico for the first time in history. But the next step offshore was already underway. We're reaching the end of the fixed platform area. That doesn't mean as oil is found in the 400 and 600 and 1,200 feet of water, the fixed platform is not going to be the choice. But the real pioneering now is in the floating drilling. Located 125 miles east-southeast of New Orleans, Ram Powell is a $1 billion state-of-the-art floating drilling and production platform. In September of 1997, oil began flowing through its steel veins. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. At the current rate, it will take an estimated 25 to 30 years to deplete an oil field estimated at 250 million barrels. Actually, it's a floating structure. It weighs uh, 41,000 tons, and it's 467 uh, feet tall, uh, size uh, 46 stories. Ram Powell is a tension leg platform or semi-submersible, capable of handling as many as 20 wells sitting in water more than 3,000 feet deep. It is secured to the ocean floor by 12 tendon-like pipes. I try to tell people that the tendons are like rubber bands. Uh, and the more you stretch them, the more tense they get or the more rigid they get. So it's the same with pipes. We are nailed in to the ocean floor, the ends of these pipes and they come up and attach to the bottom of the hull and it, it, it holds us rigid against the environmental forces such as wind and waves. Designed to withstand hurricane force winds of 140 miles per hour and waves 70 feet high, the structure moves about 300 feet from side to side. Ram Powell is capable of pumping 60,000 barrels of oil and 260 million cubic feet of gas a day. That's enough oil to drive your car more than 50 million miles and enough gas to heat 3,000 average homes for a year. Managing the volume of those natural resources is what keeps Ram Powell afloat. We got six wells uh, are already drilled and completed and they're anywhere from 18 to uh, 25,000 feet. The oil and gas are separated on the platform in a maze of pipes and then sent directly to refineries on shore. 42 barrels a minute the oil and gas travel through a network of underwater pipes 100 miles long. Floating deep water platforms like Ram Powell were designed and developed not only to withstand the realities of wind and waves, but also the harsh economic reality of increasing demand and lower oil prices in the 80s and 90s. The industry digs in its heels and realizes if you can't control the price, you've got to control your cost. To cut costs and still remain competitive, the oil companies had to find safe ways to use technology to drill more efficiently. It used to be where you needed three or four people working on a rig floor. Now you need one. Most of the work is done with a machine and the man controlling it in that shack. You got people working away from the equipment now, moving joysticks and uh, pushing buttons. When drilling moved into deep water, the jobs once performed by commercial divers became the tasks of remotely operated vehicles, or ROVs. 
although we're not as flexible as, a, as having a human being on the bottom doing the work, uh, the, the ROV companies and oil companies have gotten together and, and they've eliminated those problems by making the platforms and the fields diver friendly so that the ROV could operate all the valves and um, they could do all the tasks that needed to be done. About the size of a sport utility vehicle, this ROV is equipped with six cameras, arms capable of lifting 600 pounds, and wrists that can turn 360 degrees, and it never complains about working under pressure. Uh, the pressures at, at 3,200 feet uh, are about 1,600 pounds per square inch, which would crush a human being if, if he was able to go to that depth. The dexterity of the vehicle's arms and wrists are remotely controlled by a master arm above. We open and close valves. We can do everything from cutting cables to ropes to installing hot jumpers and electrical cables. While technology has automated much of the work aboard Ram Powell, it has also influenced the daily life of the 110 permanent employees who consider this platform home. They eat, sleep, and work out here almost six months of the year. We work a uh, 14 days on and 14 days off. So we come out and work 12-hour shifts, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. or 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. because it has to be manned 24 hours a day. The days go by pretty fast. In the evening, we kind of tend to relax and kind of uh, read and, and uh, talk to the family. We're allowed to make some phone calls and keep in touch with them. Staying in touch with friends and families on shore is an important part of life out here. If they can't reach them by phone, they can use one of several computers to access the Internet. But like any long-distance relationship, working offshore takes some getting used to. We've learned to adapt. The only thing is that... Uh, you miss a lot of the family functions, a lot of the kids, uh, baseball, whatever. We do miss a lot of that. The Ram Powell platform is actually a floating full-service city, generating enough power to light up 7,000 homes. It also produces 1,100 gallons of fresh water each day. But the bottom line out here is safety. With more than one million accident-free hours to their credit, employees on Ram Powell are expected to focus on their work. Rooms are cleaned each day and are equipped with cable television. Laundry is done for you. And more than 125,000 meals are served around the clock each year. Recreation varies from educational programs to increase your skill level and pay to an exercise room to increase your fitness. And while they are no match for the pros, offshore ping pong can get serious. Ram Powell is a reusable mobile platform. Once it has depleted the field below, it can be used as a hub for other oil fields nearby. Or it will be towed to another deep water location. You don't care where oil and gas comes from. All you care about is that you can buy it cheaply. That pretty much sums up the attitude of a gas-guzzling world that's been on the move since the end of World War II. Consumption of oil in America tripled. In Western Europe, demand increased 15 times over. And in Japan, consumption increased 137 times. People in industrialized nations were enjoying an unparalleled standard of living in the early 70s, when they were forced to confront the strategic value of oil. Attitudes were about to be tested for the first time as miles of motorists waited in their cars for higher-priced gasoline in short supply. The rise of OPEC and the OPEC embargo in the winter of 73 and 74 gave the producing nations authority, power to set the price and the level of production and that was a, a dramatic change in the history of the industry. With the price of the world's largest oil reserves controlled by OPEC, offshore oil companies began to beef up production in an effort to remain competitive with the cheaply produced yet highly priced OPEC oil, they could afford to explore for new and bigger reserves of their own. That price spike gives the industry uh, the wherewithal to look at dramatic new types of platforms, dramatic size of, of drilling equipment, all the things that it would have to do to conquer the North Sea. 
The North Sea is one of the most hostile environments on the planet. A place where 70-foot rogue waves are the rule, not the exception. It would prove to be the ultimate offshore testing ground. We have a little bit of a saying in the oil field is that uh, if it looks to be a real desolate place or a harsh environment, that's probably a place that you're going to find uh, oil or gas. In 1970, Phillips announced that they had discovered a giant oil field of more than one billion barrels in the Norwegian sector of the North Sea, enough to supply the entire world's energy needs for 20 days. The Jacob Rig Golf Tide was converted into a production platform and was soon producing 40,000 barrels a day from wells located 10,000 feet beneath the surface. Phillips finally had its feet planted firmly on the floor of the next frontier. What happened, we had the one successful discovery, which is what is now called Ecofis Field. But that gave them encouragement to continue drilling, and in fact, other fields were developed. So what started out as a very simple three or four platform concept quickly grew into what eventually turned out to be 25 plus platforms out in the immediate, what we call, greater Ecofist area. The weather conditions continued to haunt them, as did the vastness of their discovery. On April 22, 1977, North Sea pioneers were hit with the unexpected when a well on the Ecofisk Bravo platform blew out of control. 100 men on board the platform jumped overboard into the icy waters after the oil ignited. The blowout spit an estimated 125 tons of oil into the air in the first 48 hours. A safety valve at the sea floor had not been installed correctly. The, the expression a little bit that I remember when I was there and some of the old guys was the only thing between you and hell is that valve. And, uh, and that's exactly what the, uh, the case is. The blowout lasted for eight days and tossed an estimated 22,500 tons of oil into the air. There were serious consequences, but luckily no loss of life. The really one upshot was that the, uh, the regulatory process tightened up uh, dramatically after the incident. Under strict new safety measures that included better firefighting procedures, the delicate balance between risk and reward continued on a grand scale. During the heyday, we had in excess of a thousand people living and working offshore Ecofist uh, at any one point in time. So that gives you some kind of sense of the enormity of the, uh, the operation. But there was a problem. By 1984, engineers realized that the platforms were sinking. There were such withdrawal rates of the oil and the gas in the water over time that eventually the rock that was 10,000 feet below the surface started to lose strength and started to actually compact on itself is, is the term we use. To fully imagine the magnitude of the problem, you must realize that the Ecofist complex is one mile long from end to end. One mile worth of platforms, crew quarters, production equipment, separation facilities, and storage tanks, all connected by steel gangways with miles of pipe attached underneath, weighing more than 40,000 tons, and it was sinking, along with the illustrious history of offshore oil. Then out of the blue, somebody had a big idea. No one would have ever thought something like that was feasible. But it, like a lot of things, it started to build up steam. And what turned out to be really a harebrained idea in the beginning, people started to believe in. What oil workers, engineers, stockholders, and breath holders started to believe in was the idea to actually jack up six of the nine sinking platforms. Jack them up 20 feet, four of them at the same time. Jack them up just like you jack up a car, sort of. After extensive research indicated that further sinking was unlikely, the harebrained idea was about to come to life. In 1987, with the world watching, several thousand workers temporarily installed 100 hydraulic jacks with a lifting capacity of 700 tons each. With the weight of the platform supported by the jacks, welders cut out a three-foot section from each leg. Computers activated and monitored the actual elevation. Once the elevation was completed, longer leg sections were moved into place and bolted down. Amazingly, the hair-brained idea worked. 
The three and a half billion dollar operation stands as a unique feat never attempted before or since in the history of offshore drilling. And after all of this heavy lifting, the only serious accident, the loss of a fingertip and one toe. Since then, Ecofisk has been expanded with the construction of two new platforms and another 50 well unit. What we see now is in reality is that the oil that we thought would would end maybe toward the turn of the century is now expected to continue for another 30 years. So it was really a remarkable feat. In 1979, 40 miles off the coast of Norway and 1,000 feet of water, Norsk Shell discovered an even larger reserve containing more than 46 trillion cubic feet of gas, enough to supply 30 million homes with energy for 50 years. Retrieving it would revolutionize all production. Even before the gas field was considered commercially viable, Shell began building Troll, the world's tallest and heaviest platform in the calm, deep waters of Norway's fjords, safe from the force of nature's wrath in the North Sea. Reinforced with enough steel to build 15 Eiffel Towers, Troll's concrete base is as wide as three football fields and provides stability in the soft sea bed. Ever so slowly, ten of the most powerful tugs in the world began to tow the largest structure man has ever moved from the relative safety of the fjord out to the tumultuous North Sea. The 174 nautical mile journey would take six days and was choreographed by two satellite systems high above. Four days into the trip, ballast engineers flooded the huge chambers, beginning Troll's gradual descent in 1,000 feet of water. Tug strained to hold Troll in position as it sunk to the bottom, permanently committed to its position on the earth. In 1996, Troll began to bring up the equivalent of 600,000 barrels of gas per day. At its current rate, Troll can fulfill 25% of Europe's gas needs till the year 2010. Throughout its brief history, offshore oil has been driven as much by ingenuity, greed and can-do attitude as it is by its need to supply the unrelenting demand for more and more oil. American motors drive two trillion miles a year, a fact that shamelessly acknowledges that one of the real losers in the oil-fueled fight for the American dream is the environment. Santa Barbara is an interesting event in the offshore. Um, certainly the, the most visible disaster in the history of offshore production. On January 28, 1969, a Union Oil Company platform six miles offshore was drilling almost a mile beneath the surface when it punctured a pocket of petroleum under high pressure. Oil exploded so violently it ruptured the seafloor and gushed out of control. When the oil spill actually occurred in uh, 1969, it was one of those pivotal events that just happened to be at the right time and the right place to not only cause this community grave concern, but became the catalyst for probably the national, if not national, environmental movement. Uh, it wasn't just seeing the beach blackened, it was the horror of seeing thousands of animals suddenly washing up covered with oil. Uh, and then the, then the gruesome realization that this was not going to go away overnight. Not only was the oil not going to go away overnight, it was not going to stop for the next 10 days, dumping a total of three and a half million gallons of crude into the Pacific. The oil slick stretched for 20 miles down the coast and 40 miles out to sea. The California Department of Fish and Game reported the death of countless birds, fish, and other marine life. Cleanup required more than 1,000 people and 25 pieces of equipment to gather and vacuum up the oil. 500 truckloads of oil-soaked straw were taken to three different landfills. There was no denying that televised images of an environment suffocated by offshore oil had been permanently seared into the conscience of an outraged citizenry and a casually regulated offshore industry. If you look at the history of offshore production from Santa Barbara toward the present, it's a fairly amazing record of, of learning how to be clean and doing it instead of talking about it. Offshore oil did indeed clean up its act. According to the U.S. Minerals Management Service, since 1985, 534 platform pipeline accidents have spilled 29,881 gallons of oil along the California coast. A fraction of the oil spilled in the 1969 disaster. 
In the 1960s, uh, everything was moving very fast. There were no real safeguards. Uh, it was just move full speed ahead because we need to have the oil, we need to have the money that comes from it. Today, there's a much more uh, guarded reaction, uh, sort of a balanced view towards uh, both making sure that if you're going to produce economic gain off of your natural resources, that you watch for and look at what the potential impacts are and that you weigh those long before you ever allow the development to start. The very nature of offshore oil production suggests that accidents will happen, and they do. Continued public and regulatory pressure have forced the offshore industry to develop more sophisticated ways of predicting trouble before it happens. High-tech solutions include everything from submersible cameras to ultrasound scanners that travel in pipelines. While there are no guarantees against future oil leaks, blowouts and disasters, the offshore industry remains one of the most environmentally regulated throughout the world. The offshore industry's latest innovation is no exception. From the environmental standpoint, the, the vessel meets and exceeds all existing uh, regulations to this day. You are looking at the future of offshore oil drilling. 835 feet long, the Discoverer Enterprise is only 50 feet shorter than the Titanic and is an amalgamation of everything the offshore industry has learned throughout its history. This is the next generation drill ship. Basically, the Enterprise is a one-stop ship for the industry. Instead of utilizing two or three vessels, to accomplish a total well drilling and production and pipe laying package, the Enterprise offers everything you need. The Enterprise is capable of drilling in 10,000 feet of water. We have a total well depth of 35,000 feet. That's our, our limitation. If those are the drilling limitations, the expectations are even greater. Imagine trying to keep a vessel the length of the Astrodome over a 30-inch well on the ocean floor in rough weather without an anchor. These thrusters are 7,000 horsepower thrusters pushing 110,000 tons of vessel through the water, achieving zero drift when we do that. On the vessels in the past, you would achieve some type of drift off because there was not quite enough thrust to do that. But this vessel was designed with a power to be able to rotate around that spot without any drift off. It can also store 125,000 barrels of oil. The world's energy needs have grown 1 to 2 percent a year over the last 15 years, and yet virtually all the new sources of oil are in geographically remote and politically risky areas. Just how deep are we willing to drill offshore for more oil? I don't think we know how far. The, the determining factor at the end of the day in my view, will not be the technology, it'll be the economics. Can you justify from an economic standpoint to go out there? Because the fascinating part is, I think man will always figure out technically how to do it. You don't stop people from figuring out how to do it. It's just, can you afford it? And I think that'll be the ultimate question. large leaps forward in the technology of drilling offshore. The project presented an enormous challenge. How to drill to a depth of 25,000 feet at a site covered by more than 15,000 feet of water, when at the time 200 feet of water was considered a test of technology. The mohole drill must go at least a mile deeper than the deepest hole ever drilled on land. In 1960, a group of oil companies converted a surplus yard fighter barge and called it the Kaswan. The vessel was designed with an oil derrick over a hole or moon pool in the middle of the ship. At this point, engineers faced two major problems if they were going to drill in deep water. First, the drilling column would have to be over two miles long. And second, how to hold the ship steady in waters too deep for anchors. When you go to floating drilling, the industry had to come up with ways to handle the motion of the vessel in relationship to the ocean floor which is fixed. And so over the years we have innovated and designed a lot of different equipment that compensates for this motion because a ship moves up and down in the water depending upon the waves and the wind that's happening. 
having seen a New England lobster fisherman use his engine to remain stationary in water while pulling his traps. Engineers decided that several propellers would be installed on the ship to counteract the wind, waves, and ocean currents. In March of 1961, 40 miles off the coast of Baja, California, in 12-foot seas, the Cus-1 drilled a 110-foot hole in 11,700 feet of water. The core samples, dating back 15 to 20 million years, revealed an ocean with far more life than today, which was good news for the oilmen because where there are fossils, there is fuel. As quickly as it started, the Mohol project ended in bureaucratic bickering. While the project did not drill to the center of the earth, it did put Santa Barbara at the center of offshore oil drilling, which was remarkable considering the 100-foot depth that was manageable from offshore rigs in the Gulf at the time. Not counting the oil produced off the piers at the turn of the century, California produced its first offshore oil in 1962. The market for marine drilling took off. After several years of drilling successfully, ships were developed with larger hulls and bigger drilling platforms. Positioning was aided by the use of a taut wire system attached to the sea floor. Any change in the angle signaled a series of thrusts from the propellers to push the vessel back into position. The history of drilling for oil offshore is full of booms, busts, boondoggles and bankruptcies. As far back as anyone can remember, the sea provoked the passions of risk takers, those who wanted to make a difference. Offshore oil has never been for the faint of heart. Offshore oil has always had this sense of adventure and it, it, there's a real keen edge that puts on it. From giant multinational corporations to independent wildcatters, the oceans became the ultimate frontier. We've had a history of having people that don't mind thinking broadly and outside the box, so to speak. There were no rules, no regulations. Just go out and do the best you can and hope it works. Fueled by the world's growing demand and dependence on cheap oil, the pioneers pushed farther and farther offshore into remote and hostile environments. Some people compare what we're doing in deep water today to what people are doing in outer space. The oceans and their vast reserves still embody the greatest challenge and reward for those brave or cavalier enough to explore them. One of the striking things is the, is the extent to which this is a fraternity. Uh, it's people who have literally grown up and gone out deeper and deeper together. The history of offshore oil is brief, yet bountiful. Lots of crazy notions turn into brilliant ideas that materialize in mythic proportions. The pioneering spirit of drilling for oil offshore began 24 hours after World War II ended. The rationing of gasoline was lifted and America celebrated the wonders of oil. America was ready to roll after World War II. People had been waiting 10, 15, 20 years of depression. They'd been fighting wars for four and five years away from home. They wanted to come back and get on with their real lives. And the oil industry had grown steadily from the 1880s forward, but it was really primed to boom after World War II with the, with the growth in highways, the, the urge to get out and travel. After the war, demand for oil far exceeded supply. Drivers took to the roads at such a rate that gasoline sales nearly doubled by 1950. By now, oil had exceeded coal in meeting America's energy needs. It's the wildcatter idea to go find oil. It's very obvious that bigger fields can be found offshore than on the land onshore that's been explored so thoroughly. So that's a, a big attraction. Where do you find some bigger fields? For millions of years, everything from dinosaurs to dead plants have accumulated on the seafloor. Through time, heat and pressure turned this organic material into petroleum, which has been trapped in reservoirs by layers of rock. The Gulf of Mexico was an ideal place to start drilling offshore because it had a relatively shallow and gently sloping seabed. Many of the most popular areas for oil and gas exploration today are what we call historic deltas, just like the Mississippi, where you've got a lot of junk coming out and being deposited. 
the Mississippi River basically collects all, all of the silt and sand and other type of things from the mid parts of the United States and comes out and dumps it. And it's been going on for millions of years. So the sands that we need to be able to ultimately trap oil and gas are there and have been laid down over the millions of years. And it's just a rich, very rich environment for hydrocarbons. At the birth of the Gulf of Mexico offshore industry, it's clear that, that the, the primary constraint on development of these offshore fields will be how much it costs to drill exploratory wells. The first concept was to actually build some sort of board road out over the marsh or swamp, build a foundation of piling and put the rig on it. And that was a lot of construction. And so then the idea came, let's dig a canal and put your rig on a barge and float the barge out there. In fact, barges of all kinds were left over from the war and in great supply when engineers hired by Kerr-McGee converted a surplus Navy landing craft into a low-tech hybrid drilling rig. In October 1947, ten and a half miles off the Louisiana coast, they struck oil. For about five years, uh, the companies have more success with uh, this system where they have the old converted World War II ships uh, that, that are half mobile and half permanent. They build a small platform with a tender, they call it, and the tender holds most of the equipment and most of the men, and if you don't find oil, you can at least tow the tender vessel somewhere else. The trouble is, if you, if you have to build a fixed structure every time you want to drill a well, it becomes very expensive. And the deeper the water, 25 feet would be five times as expensive as building something in 10 feet of water. In this period, those are just giant economic costs, and if you can't find a way to salvage some of the costs, uh, you just can't compete with the onshore drillers. And it's fairly clear in the early 50s that either that question will be resolved or the offshore business will not grow. In 1954, a young Marine superintendent named Doc Laborde designed and built his own offshore drilling rig. His vessel, which was named Mr. Charlie, drilled its first well in 40 feet of water. It was one of the earliest six million dollar investment. Currently, operators and contractors use jackups to drill most offshore wells. Apart from the legs and the jacks, the platform resembles that of a standard drilling barge. Through the years, different jackup designs have increased their water depth from 80 feet to almost 400 feet. It's an amazingly creative era for that mobile drilling technology and the reason it's so important so a lot of people have an incentive to, to work hard on mobility so that you can find the oil and move on and then have a permanent platform built wherever you find it. We had some ups and downs but it, I liked it. I loved the business. It was pioneering. It's been said that a drilling rig is nothing more than a portable hole factory. Be it large or small, offshore or on, its main job is drilling wells. In 1883, spiritualist H.L. Williams didn't even need to drill a hole to find oil after a modest earthquake sent a spurt of the stuff as large as a man's arm right out of the ground near his home several miles southeast of Santa Barbara. Eventually, Williams and others started drilling plenty of holes, and by 1895, there were 28 oil wells producing 16,904 barrels a year. When better producing sites were found on the beach, Williams built a rickety wooden wharf and drilled the first wells over the sea. By the turn of the century, piers and wharfs reached out 1,200 feet from the shoreline into water 30 feet deep. By 1910, all of these fields were in sharp decline and drilling for oil off piers into the Pacific Ocean soon ran into a geological and technical wall. The continental shelf off the coast of California was steep and deep and loaded with fault lines. The drilling techniques used in the Gulf of Mexico were impractical. If they wanted any more oil out of this narrow channel, they would have to leave land and drill deeper than they'd ever drilled before. The solution would come 50 years later in an unusual scientific experiment. It was, a, it was a glorious age for science in the late 50s and early 60s. We're, we're looking at space adventures, and they, they thought of the Moho Project as the exploration of inner space, they called it. If we were going toward the moon, as we thought we were, why not go toward the center of the Earth? Mohol is the name given to the area between the Earth's crust and the Earth's mantle. 
While the Earth's crust is approximately 24 miles thick, it is thinnest deep under the oceans. Scientists and oil men alike were interested in drilling this deep to retrieve sediment samples that could tell them how the Earth formed as well as how and where oil is trapped. This required, however, particularly mobile offshore drilling units. Designed to explore for oil in shallow water, several compartments in the barge were flooded, causing it to sink and rest on the sea floor. While the workstation on columns remained above water, if oil was discovered, a platform could then be built to produce the oil. If oil was not discovered, Mr. Charlie pumped the water out, packed up, and moved on to the next prospect. Between 1954 and 1958, more than 30 submersibles were built, each one different from the others. Mr. Charlie continued drilling until it was retired in 1990 and turned into a museum. By permanently mounting a drilling rig on a submersible barge, oilmen were able to move from well to well in a matter of days. This innovation not only separated the functions of oil exploration from oil production, but it lowered the cost of exploration which helped make offshore oil a viable commodity. Uh, at the bottom is money. Uh, control of the land meant money and um, uh, they didn't have much understanding at all in the 19, early 50s how much money, but it was clear there was money to be made by leasing the land. In 1953, Congress passed the Submerged Land Act which divided continental waters in two. The area within a three-mile limit was given to the states and the rest given to the federal government. This piece of legislation generated enormous revenues for the government, second only to income taxes. Offshore oil exploded. By 1957, there were over 100 new mobile drilling units. If offshore oil was going to continue to remain competitive with onshore oil, they would have to find ways to be more efficient and cost-effective. The solution was the lighter and less expensive Jackup rig. The Jackup is basically a floating barge with legs that are attached to the barge. So when you get to your drilling location, you jack the legs down to the ocean floor and then raise the barge up out of the water. And that way you have a stable drilling platform in which to conduct your drilling operations. The innovative jack-up rig attracted the attention of a young oil man from Midland, Texas. We worked out a deal with Letourneau, who had a new kind of offshore drilling rig, three-legged rig, None of the major companies or drilling contractors would touch it, so we kind of gambled and uh, built the first and second and third. With little or no solid information about wind and wave strength in the Gulf, the prospectors and their rigs were vulnerable to disaster. Our timing was good. We suffered a couple of setbacks. The third one or fourth one disappeared in a hurricane. I mean, it just vanished. We'd taken the people off and it was gone. 